Hello there, Drew Hanish of Whiskey Lore, and back with me again is my guest Rory Glasgow from uh, Ben Reich this time. Ben Reich, we're going to talk about, and we're going to talk about Glenn Glasgow. So uh, last time, Thank you so last much. time we talked about uh, Glenn Dronick, and um, we're just expanding all across the uh, most interesting parts of Speyside and and the uh, Highlands there. So uh, welcome back. Thank you so much. Cheers, Drew. Thanks for yeah. having me back. So, as much as I love talking about Glendronic, these are probably, especially Glenglassa, I love talking about because people haven't really heard of this distillery, perhaps. It's one that flies under the radar. So, I'm really excited to talk about all the changes that have happened to Ben Reik and all the interesting things that happen at this perhaps more mysterious distillery that is Glenglassa. Yeah. So, Glendronic is a bit more of a it's definitely in the spotlight right now, and it has been for a number of years, so we're looking to kind of build up perhaps some of these other ones. So excited to talk about it. <laughs> well, and I have seven whiskeys lined up here, so we have plenty to get into, <laughs> and, uh, and and it's going to be great because I, I did a little pre-tasting on some of these, and uh, there's a really wide range of flavors going on in these, so it's not going to get stale and boring between each of these different whiskeys that we're going to jump into. Absolutely not. And we'll see, I mean, even within the distilleries, the variation on expressions and the versatility and robust nature of these distilleries is so amazing. And Glendronic, not to go back and compare, but sherry casks, phenomenal job, even some port casks in there. But what we're going to see across both of these ranges at Glendronic and Glenglassa is going to be quite eclectic, quite yeah. unique. So we're going to have a lot so of So one of the things, this is unique for me because... For people who may be just getting into drinking scotch, this is the first time that we've been able to talk about a Ben and a Glen mm. in the same episode. So I thought it'd be interesting to relate the the meanings of these words because people will talk about scotch whiskeys and they'll say the Glens because there are so many Glen, <laughs> Glen Glasso, Glen Dronick, Glen uh, Livet. We can go through a ton of Glens. And we can also go through a ton of bends. So uh, kind of give us a little breakdown on the um, these names and how they came about. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it is funny. I've heard some funny things from, from malt drinkers. As people are starting their journey, I, I hear people saying, oh, I only drink Glens and I only drink Benz <laughs> or whatever. And I'm... And that to me, I'm like, I, I don't understand what that means, but I can give you a breakdown on the terminology is, you know, what that means, especially in Gaelic, so yeah. Gaelic. So Ben means hill or mountain. So the tallest mountain in the United Kingdom happens to be in Scotland and it's called Ben Nevis. So it's the hill of Nevis. And um, like most distilleries, of course, um, the second part will be something denoting to something usually in Gaelic, and then that will have a translation. So Ben meaning hill or mountain, Ben Reik, obviously, being the hill of Reik. Now, if you go to Ben Reik, and I was just there three weeks ago, um, you you wouldn't think you wouldn't necessarily say it was on a hill, um, <laughs> but certainly it's not necessarily in a glen either. Um, although it is in the Spey Valley, I guess you could say you know it certainly is in a wider valley in Speyside. Um, and even the, the translation, you know, Scots Gaelic is now having a kind of resurgence in Scotland, which is really nice. And even I have Ooh. been trying my hand um, at it. It's not easy, I have to admit, <laughs> but I have been inspired by some friends back home that are, are getting into it, which is great to see that resurgence. But we've even seen a couple of translations of Reich in uh, across the years of Ben Reich as we've kind of evolved. We initially thought it meant the red stag, so which yeah. sounds lovely, the hill of the red stag, very Scottish, quintessential, beautiful, kind of misty mountainside, and uh, just a kind of glorious red stag standing proud but we have changed that to actually go back as we looked in the records to Ben Reik actually used to be the site of an old farm and even now if you go to Ben Reik, there is literally a farm against the border of the distillery and when I was there they'll rotate it actually so there uh, actually the tw two times I've been there there's been pigs big massive mm. pigs that are there so there's a big farm there and so there used to be a farm like many distilleries you know they would have started distilling excess grain uh, obviously notably barley and so they would have then expanded that out so it makes sense and so reek now we understand means actually diversity oh. and it means that the farm itself would have just rotated whatever they would do crops they would do obviously livestock um, and have that diverse um, nature in their farm, which is lovely now that we look at Ben Reik and we'll obviously find this out as we're going through it, but it's a very 
eclectic and diverse distillery we do a lot of different styles of cask types of spirit styles as well so it all kind of plays into each other which is quite nice and then glen on the other hand is a valley so you've got the bends and the glens yeah. and so a lot of older distilleries typically tend to go with glen because especially where you're looking at you know the most important thing for a distillery is water and if you are an older distillery and you're building yourself in a valley you're obviously going to be collecting that runoff water from the hills into the valley and then so you just plunk your little distillery on top of that water source so it makes sense to name yourself after a glen and in glenglassa's sake glenglassa actually means the valley of the and glass is an interesting word because it can mean gray or green mm -hmm. and so it's kind of the green and gray place um and it makes perfect sense if you ever get a chance to go there or even look online Although most of the pictures do it a lot of justice online, which is great. But when you go there, it can either be quite overcast because it is a very kind of coastal location. We are right on the North Sea, um, but it's very luscious. It's very kind of just bursting with greenery. So it's perfect. Gray and green, very literal. And it's the valley of that. So it's a lovely and spot. And that's actually a burn, correct? Which is a name for a It creek. is as well. The glass yeah. of burn. It is as well. So usually, you know, even Glendronach will note to the Dronach burn as well. So they even will get even more specific with this is the actual water source as well. Um, and actually, Glenglassa even used to have an estate called the Glassa Estate uh -huh. as well with the Glassa burn running through it. Um, and obviously that then is translated from Gaelic into English as grey and green. So, yeah, there's uh, they won't, we don't, these aren't just plucked names out of a hat. They're not marking um, kind of favorable names. They're just... They're so I'm going to yeah. put your knowledge to the test. Do you know what Do you know oh. what the Dronic burn was called before it was the Dronic burn? Well, oh, I do. I knew. I knew it comes from the Balnoon Hills, and I was just there, <laughs> and I even have pictures of the water source. And we were talking about this, and the Glendronic. I am. I'm flagging. It's do a you know Fendraff burn. Was the Fendraff burn? Yeah. And there's also, yeah, I mean, that's even the same case with um, Glassa. So it's the four dice oh. burn as well, which actually runs from, well, I guess when it ran through the Glassa state, they then called it the Glassa burn, but actually it's the four dice burn that runs into the Glassa state. So give or take, you could call it, you know, depending on what you're looking at, you could call it the four dice burn that runs into the Glassa stream and then out into yeah. the ocean. So, yeah. So it, it, I guess the estate would then kind of have their, their name <laughs> on it. Um, but yeah, no, you're totally right. And I, I was there and we were kind of um, finding the source as when it came out into the open from the hills at Glendronic. We were just doing that three mm. weeks ago and it was, yeah, we were talking about all the other names that we had. <laughs> yeah. And then the other would be uh, Strath because uh, the Strath's mm -hmm. Bay Railway used to go by there. So I think a, a Glen, isn't it kind of like a, 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 a deeper valley, whereas like a, a Strath is a wider valley? Yeah, wider okay. yeah strath's bay valley yeah. yeah which if you go to space side you'll see that you've obviously got you know very kind of what it doesn't really well it does i mean it feels like a valley at some points but it's very very yeah. wide yeah okay absolutely. so we have lots yeah. of whiskey to taste here so we do i think we should let's start, jump right? right in on uh glenn glassa and um you turn me on to these guys with the um with the last interview and i had to go out and buy a bottle of torfin so we'll get to that that'll be the third because that's um, that's going to be peated. Uh, and so we have one peated expression, and then we're going to go first and start with Revival, which is a very interesting name. How long has this whiskey been around, and what uh, what kind of barrels are we using for this? So this, the name itself denotes to, so Glen Glassa will obviously get into the timelines and the history and all that, um, but I do want to get cracking into this whiskey. But to give you the quick synopsis for this one, um, Glen Glassa was closed for a long time. It was closed from the 1980s up into 2008 when it reopened. So this was the first expression that we actually released was Glen Glassa Revival. And so quite confusing now, if, if you're listening to the Glendronic podcast or no Glendronic, that we obviously have a revival in our portfolio at Glendronic. Um, but we also, I mean, it makes a lot of sense for Glen Glassa as well as Glendronic, but revival meaning that we revived the distillery back to life in 2008. So this was the first exp expression that came out off the distillery. Um, if you're looking on, on the video, you'll see it has a lovely kind of reddish hue here, um, denoting to perhaps some of the barrels that are going into some of the casks. Uh, so we are actually using a combination of bourbon 
and red wine casks. Now we initially, I believe, used Rioja red wine casks. We then moved to, I think, French Bordeaux red wine casks. And then we actually re-rack that ex-bourbon and ex-red wine casks into Oloroso mm. sherry butts um, for a further maturation. So really, it's three casks that we're using in this one. And it's funny, when you look at where Glenglassa is on the map, it really does, and especially when you look at it in comparison to the whiskey regions, although Spacehead can be a little bit inflated or quite constricted depending on what map you're looking at, it uh, it really does, Glenglassa straddles that Highland and Spacehead border. It's got one foot in the Spacehead region, one foot in the Highlands. And I feel like the revival really is more of the style leaning towards the Highlands. We'll find with the evolution, which we'll get to later, is more leaning towards Speyside. So this is going to be a bit rich, robust, and those casks, again, are going to obviously impart lots of flavor, lots of color into that whiskey. So let's say uh, you've got it there, I can yes. see. So let's give us a wee nose. Yeah, and I mean, this one is so, where the, the, sh the sherry comes right out to me the the raisins i get that i got cinnamon roll out of this which i kind of like the the yeah. um there's there's sweetness in these that is uh it's almost candy like but it's not it, it's not sickly sweet it's just uh, a very no. nice um I, I wouldn't would you call it a dessert whiskey in a way so uh, you're right i think you're spot on when you say because i don't like talking about a, a spirit style being sweet, but I think in Glen Glass's term, I think it makes a ton of sense because it really is quite sweet, almost confectionery like. And it's funny you say that because um, with my job, I kind of I work a lot on the marketing for these single malts, so we look at trying to bring fun ways to taste these. And for Glen Glass, I actually put together a, a program called A Whiskey Shaped by Land and Sea, which was me trying to bring Scottish flavor to these whiskies and trying to, especially for an American audience, trying to experience some traditional Scottish um, foods. And one of them was the confectionery. So we had tablet, sea salt, caramel, and, um, and some shortbread infused with mint for these whiskies. And this paired really well with sea salt mm. caramels. So it does actually pair well with confectionery because it is quite a sweet yeah, style. Spirit. Yeah, yeah. Um, and yeah, absolutely right. Dried fruits coming out of there, definitely from the Oloroso cask. But certainly that sweetness almost comes through as like a caramel note again, hence why we paired it with yeah. caramel. Butterscotch, kind of that Werther original mm -hmm. note coming through there. And then you kind of get those hints of uh, kind of red fruit coming through. And that's certainly from that red wine cask. The tannins you start to pick up on the palate as well when you taste this. So let's go ahead yeah. and give this a wee, a wee taste. So Slanja for the first dram. Oh, man. These are really nice when they hit the palate. I mean, they you really get, um, there's a lot of, of fruit. I get a little citrus. I get grape in there. It seems to come through for mm -hmm. me. Um, it was the first time when I tasted one that I kind of went, well, hey, you know what? I sort of sense melon in there. It's It has. Yeah. Yeah. Nice fruit. Very, very interesting. Absolutely. The mouthfeel, particularly on all of these whiskeys, is so viscous it's quite oily it's rich it's full-bodied mm -hmm. and this really plays into the history as well as well as to why Glen Glassa maybe wasn't quite as famous as we would like it to be nowadays because it is quite a, a rich and robust spirit so blenders back in the day found it quite difficult to use this in they had to use it quite yeah. sparingly purely because it was going to influence a blend if you were adding a lot of this in so only minute amounts were going into blends which wasn't great for yeah. the distillery um so it's great that the single malt market has picked up because we're able to enjoy this spirit um in its isolation which I is had so to, nice um and it, i was gonna say i laughed because i was doing research on this a little bit ahead of time to learn something about the distillery and and i read that they said that you know here's a problem we would love to have today but back then they said it's too complex so so it's no yep. good to us because <laughs> they could because they <laughs> could put in blends that's it. It plagued it. It really did. Um, and we'll get into that. It's, I think Glen Glass has been known as a, a number of things throughout the years, but uh, the luckiest distillery in Scotland is is one thing mm. that you'll see written by some prolific uh, whiskey writers in their books and writings. And it really does make sense because we're lucky that it's still here today because a lot of distilleries that, again, you would think, brilliant problem to have, right? You've got powerful, great tasting whiskey, rich and robust, full bodied, but Back in the day when blending was the name of the game and that's how distilleries made their money, that was you need to have that solid foundation of contracts. Glenglassa just mm. struggled um, throughout its lifetime really until recently. 
to make whiskey that um, was appealing to the masses. So now we are making single malt and that's obviously being picked up by people and they're able to taste it once again. But um, one thing as well, we'll find this across the range, but it comes through, I think in the contrasting sweet notes that you get in Glen Glass Revival is because we are a coastal distillery, we are very small, and this goes for all three distilleries, but certainly in Glen Glass's case, because we are a coastal distillery, we do mature mm-hmm. on site. So we do get this, and when you're at the distillery, it is windy. I mean, we'll even get into some of the history about there was even windmills that were constructed Mm. in that area because it was such a windy area. So you're getting the North Sea coming straight in. The warehouses are there, the rack warehouses, the dunnage warehouses, and they are getting ventilated by that sea air. So you are getting this kind of imparting of this almost salinity, contrasting the sweetness, giving you sea salt caramel almost in these whiskies um and it is lovely it is and you're getting all the the tannins coming from the red wine cask as well picking up that savoriness and just running with it it is such a glorious whiskey for people looking into get and it's very peppery too on the finish and does is that coming from the malt so it's actually a young whiskey as well. I mean, we shouldn't forget that there is no age on the three whiskies that we have at Glenglass in our core range. So that's Revival, Evolution, and Torfa. There is no age on these. We're not hiding anything mm-hmm. at all. It was purely because... And actually, the, the second whiskey we'll try along the way um, from Glenglass is Evolution. And this really could be used for all three expressions. But we... and t- Well, Billy Walker back in the day when he released these whiskies, and we'll get into the timelines soon enough, but he expected these... Um, whiskies to evolve each time they were vatted and bottled so they really have changed and even my experience I worked in a pub in Edinburgh called the Canny Man's for about six years and we had a bottle of Revival on our shelf and even stranger actually now our global um, head of advocacy for the single malts he is a man that is based in Edinburgh um, and he actually used to live along the road from the pub that I worked at and the day that Billy Walker bought the distillery, um, Douglas Cook, who had been working with Billy Walker on the kind of marketing and sales side of things, he came into the pub and actually cracked the bottle off Glen Glass Revival, and I was the one <laughs> serving him. And little did I know, I would be, it is a crazy wow. small world, the whiskey industry. But yeah, I only just found that out a few weeks ago, and it's like, yeah, you must have been the one that I came in and cracked the bottle on. But um, yeah, and that has dramatically Mm. changed because that was one of the first bottlings off revival and since then it has just gotten older and older and older and it goes for all three of the expressions at glenglassa so because the distillery was reopened in 2008 we're obviously working with new make spirit we had a lot of older vintages that uh, highland distillers sold to um, a private group of, of investors and Stuart Nickerson, who then was bought by um, Billy Walker, who then took it over. But so there's a lot of vintage stock and older stock at Glen Glasser that they kind of used to sell off to obviously get some money for repairing the distillery because it was in pretty bad shape when they got it in 2008 because um, it hadn't been opened since the 1980s, yeah. essentially. So a lot of that money was going into repairs and they're obviously looking at getting set up and running with making new make. So yeah, the pepperiness certainly does come from its mm. youth. But my God, it really does for being, I mean, the revival, depending on the bottling date, which will be lasered on the back um, of your bottle. I have a 2019 bottling. So we're probably looking at this being coming up to, I mean, almost the kind of looking at eight, nine years old, uh-huh. possibly with these whiskies now. So we are getting very close to um, a kind of 10 year old now with these expressions, depending on the bottling date. This is a 22. Um, it's still going to so... be fairly young. You have a 2022 20, there. Yeah. Well, there you go. You've got the oldest one. <laughs> the yeah. Very nice. So that again, they've all yeah. evolved. Will um, they have, will they have I, an age statement at some point? I was just going to say, so that, yeah, is alluding to, you know, potentially we're getting to the point now where there are, things happening in the background where we might start seeing some movement on Glen Glassa because um, we'll obviously get into Ben Rieke, but that's undergone quite a big major facelift and rebranding and new portfolio for the core range and things and um, so I think next in line will be Glen Glassa to get a little bit of attention which I just can't wait because um, if anyone's tr- if you've tried Glen Glassa, whether it's the core range or even some of the older stock that has been very I think really made a name for itself in the private mm-hmm. bottling arena people really got to know Glen Glassa that way it is just amazing stuff whether it's old or whether it's young it, the spirit itself is just so complex and again to its hindrance back in the day for blending purposes but for single malt outstanding so i think this is kind of the sleeping giant right now in our in our portfolio of three distilleries so i can't hmm. wait to see 
what happens with this distillery. So let's talk about, first of all, where the distillery is, because as you mentioned, it's up uh, on the North Sea and it's kind of away from everything else. I drove up there and the way I got there was by, I was coming back from Aberdeen and so I just decided to go along the North Coast and that's when I saw it. Unfortunately, I didn't get to go in because it was a um, Sunday morning, but um, but beautiful drive there along the shore. It's gorgeous. And, um, but like I say, it's a little bit, it's north of Elgin, so it's, uh, and, and below Elgin is where all of the other space side distilleries are. And so it's a little mm -hmm. bit out of the way. Has it always been out of the way or was there, do you know if there was uh, distilling activity up there besides that up in that area? There was interestingly, and actually this is just, I'm not to promote a book here. I can't remember where <laughs> I put it down now, but there's a lovely book um, eaten by, written by Ian Buxton who writes, it's called um, Glen Glassa Distillery Revived. Um, and it really is a great book about the whole history. And he does talk to about some records that they were able to get their hands on um way back there was a distillery company mentioned called the port soy distilling company in 1800 that was like i think in the edinburgh advert advertiser mm. which was denoting to a distillery that would have been in port soy which is about fair though that's about less than a couple of miles away from the distillery it's very very close um and then even actually a distillery that was then locally known as the Banffshire distillery um, there's n the last record I think we have of that distillery in particular was in like I think the, the 1830s, um, which actually ties in very nicely to Glen Glass's history as well. So that's kind of the one I guess official distillery that we have. But of course there was lots of illicit distillation going on in yeah. that area because lots of farming going on even now actually where you would have seen it all the lovely barley fields that's up in that area. It's very agriculturally driven, and actually even lots of maltsters in that area as well. So in Bucky, um, there is Port Gordon's Maltings, um, and another Maltings actually there as well, and that is where we get our malt for Glen Glass up in Rake and Glen Dronach. Um, so yeah, certainly it was like a prime spot, proven water source, whether it was legal or illicit <laughs> distillation, yeah. um, and of course the barley was there as well. Uh, but interestingly, the distillery that I spoke about there, the the Port Soy Distilling Company, so. Our founder for Glen Glassa is a, a chap named Colonel James Moyer, and he was, I guess you want to describe him as like a local entrepreneur, he was also a philanthropist as well, so he really did a lot in the local area. He was known as being, um, well he actually I think was a representative for the North of Scotland Banking mm. Group, so he was a representative there. He brought banking up into that area, was really the head of commerce for that particular area in the northeast of Scotland. He brought the railways up into Banffshire, so he was really kind of accredited with passing parliamentary acts to then expand the railways up there and then heading west. Um, he even owned a merchant shop as well where he stocked wine and liquors. I think he even had his hand as well in, what was I reading recently? It was something to do with Peruvian guano or hmm. something. He was bringing in, because he had a lot of to do with farming and agriculture, so a lot of um, manure stocks that he was working with as well. So really a jack of all trades. It really had, um, he was kind of the life and soul of that area of Scotland. And because he was dealing with commerce, because he was dealing with merchants um, uh, for selling wine and liquors, he probably would have sold um, a lot of that whiskey that would have been at that point in the 19, in the 1830s for the uh, Port Soy Distilling Company. And because he was in commerce and banking, he probably had an understanding as to why that distillery didn't yeah. work. So when he set the distillery up for Glen Glassa in 1875, probably had a good idea of what to do and what not to do. And um, so he set it up along with his two nephews and a coppersmith as well. And he placed it right perched on this lovely, I don't want to say cliff face, but it really is perched up high. I mean, you would have seen it from the beach. I don't know if you ever got down to the beach. I, I, uh, I didn't. Sand is, is Port Soy the town oh. that has the uh, the large, almost aqueduct looking bridge that goes across it? I'm trying to remember what town I was in that, that I saw that. Oh, it's, it, it's just a really tall it. bridge. It's not an aqueduct, but I mean, just sort of reminded me of that because I, you come driving over the hill going uh, west, and and all of a sudden you're like mm -hmm. in this town, and then you see this huge bridge off in the in the distance. Oh, I oh um, oh gosh, I think I know what bridge you're talking about, but I think it is in that area. Yeah, yeah Port Soy is 
right down the so I think it's about two point two miles away from Glen Glass, if I'm correct. So it could okay. be that bridge. I'm not entirely yeah, yeah. sure. I actually do forget if they've got a bridge or not. Um but yeah, so he essentially looked at placing the distillery where there had been proven water supplies. And water actually will come into I don't know if you looked into this in your research, but water was one of the attributing reasons as to why Glen Glassa had a tough time um throughout of its existence, which we can talk about um in a okay. little bit. But where we're perched is lovely right on this kind of a top of this not quite a cliff but facing the north sea and facing the lovely sand end bay um it's a lovely beach it's actually very popular with surfers mm. if you can imagine it in scotland <laughs> be wearing two layers there if you're going out there in a wetsuit um but people do do it and um again just talking about our warehouses facing that north sea breeze we will get some of that impact from the north sea coming in um, but yeah, actually, let's just talk about the water, actually, because that's, I guess we're kind of all yeah. tailing into this, yeah, what makes a distillery. So back then, I guess, in the 1800s, certainly into the later part of the 1800s, the most important thing for a distillery was the water. And if you ever look at kind of old records of why distilleries didn't work or why they were closed or why they never really got off the ground, it was usually attributed to the water source was what most people would have said now of course with science we know that it's a lot to do with your fermentations a lot to do with wood management in your warehouse um how you're distilling of course as well makes a huge impact on your spirit style so water was really for just obviously thinking about what's going in as the primary ingredient here almost water was seen as being the most important part of course it is important you want to have good water we know that but it has been kind of pop down in terms of the ranking of what is the most important things for a distillery. But Glenglassa, where we are, that water is essentially coming back in the highlands and it's traveling all the way down until it exits into the North mm. Sea uh, Ocean at Sandin Bay. So we're collecting that water source at its absolute peak minerality. And so that was really the attributing reason as to why Glenglassa had this really unusual characteristic of being very luscious and you didn't quite pick it up in the revival but we certainly will in the evolution it is very tropical mm. um and a lot of that was placed on the water and um, just having this mineral density and certainly we can talk about to it now as being potentially a reason everything makes a difference but certainly that was really heavily scrutinized as being the water and blenders like we said before sparingly used it in blends and so glenglassa was well loved by the industry i think when people think about a distillery not getting a lot of love. Glen Glasser certainly did have a lot of love. People really respected it, but they just could not use enough of it for it to sustain um, the costs of production. And so it was open, it was running, it had contracts. Um, it was fairly successful when it was open, but we talked about this with Glendronic and we'll talk about it with Ben Reik. All distilleries, especially around that time period, would have had to deal with the blow that was the Patterson's mm -hmm. crash at the turn of the century going into the year 1900. And so Glenglassa held on until 1907, and unfortunately it was closed. Um, and actually at that point, it moved from, obviously Colonel James Moyer would have uh, passed away at this point, and his nephews very quickly sold it to another chap who then very quickly <laughs> moved it on to and sold it to Highland Distillers, um, which of course would then go on to be um, bought by Edrington in 1999. But uh, Highland Distillers saw fit to close it in 1907, um, strangely for the war effort in World War II became a bakery um, <laughs> which was quite interesting we don't have much history on what happening what was I wonder, happening I wonder if it would time. be pita so, bread I know right it's smoky bread because <laughs> it, 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 uh, it makes sense yeah. because you're already dealing with grain absolutely and, of course yeah it makes sense you've got pretty much half the thing yeah. you need to make uh, yeah. bread yeah so you're yeah exactly so we're you know we're milling we're um, we're malting as well so it makes sense yeah we're dealing with grain <laughs> And, uh, and actually as well, back in oh, mid-1800s, there was, I don't know if you saw it when you were there, did you see a big stone-looking um, kind of structure? It, I've seen, it I've seen pictures like of it, yeah. It kind of, it's a, a right. circular thing. It's a, almost like a jug out in the middle of the, is that what you're talking about? Like a little yes. a so Adobe hut or something? <laughs> exactly. It's locally known as a cup of oh, saucer, okay. which was back in the day, would have been there would have been a wooden structure on top of that which that would have housed all the gears and um the windmill itself but obviously that base foundation was uh, all made of stone and so yeah i mean literally there was lots of agricultural obviously that mill was 
well gone mm. by that point for the war. Um, so they weren't obviously using that with uh, the inclusion of steam power and coal and all that coming into play. But yeah, um, that's a real historic relic that we have on site at the distillery. And um, yeah, some really fascinating history with that as well. That doesn't quite tie into yeah, the distillery, yeah. but certainly, uh, well, how, yeah, it's how, really cool. What is the age... Uh, are, are there any of the buildings there that date back to that 1875 date, or has a lot of it been reconstructed? A lot of it has been reconstructed, but some of the old um, stone brick buildings, I mean, all most of it is stone. You, I mean, if you drove in, you'll see there's quite a defined difference between the old stone brick buildings, and there was kind of late 1950s going into the 60s. Well, it was built in 1958, I think it was, when they finished that, going into the 1960s. This kind of classic 50s concrete mm. looking building and it has this kind of it's actually very lovely i mean it's it was very well built um but i think to maybe our eye now when it comes to distilleries we love the old brick stone but when it comes to that 1950s era building um i think they tried yeah. their best given the architectures at the time but they kind of have this lovely slanted roof that looks like waves on top of the building um but it's a very definite difference there in the style of architecture but there are some older buildings that date back to the earlier period of the distillery so some of those kind of central stone buildings absolutely certainly would have dated back to those times yeah and it was a big distillery if you ever look at some of the older pictures the distillery goes all the way down almost to the not quite to the water but it does go all the way down the hill but now we don't even know actually what happened to mm. those buildings um some of those warehouses floor maltings they would have been lost to possibly fire possibly disrepair possibly just scaling back of the distillery and then just letting go into disrepair and then eventually just demolished so um yeah Glen glass is i think with of, co of course you know having the the funds that brown foreman brings as being the parent company now hopefully we can start to get some more research into the historical um findings at Glen glass and get some more of that stuff paved out because it would be great to to know more about this quite elusive yeah. distillery we do know some bits but so if it came back around 1960 and it was owned still by Highland Distillers, it what mm -hmm. blends would we have been going into? Uh, like Famous Grouse, I think, was one that they owned. Potentially. I actually don't. Yeah, Famous Grouse, certainly. I don't know. We don't actually have records of what blends, or I've never been made aware of what blends that Glen Glasser went into. But the same problem persisted. And actually, in this time period when it was open from the 60s, um, it probably did make it into some blends, but it still struggled, and it still struggled to. And actually, they tried to, I guess, tame is maybe the word I'm going to use here, tame Glen Glassa, um, which is great that yeah, it's untamed exactly. now because really we're seeing the benefits of it. But they tried to tame it in so many funny ways. It's a great case study for seeing how difficult it can be to be a distillery that just has a very unique profile. So. The owners at the time, Highland, they owned, you know, Glen Rothes was one of the distilleries that was fairly close by that they were obviously having quite a lot of success with that's been used in blends throughout its time. Um, and so they actually started bringing water from Glen Glass's source to, sorry, from Glen Rothes's <laughs> source in Speyside to Glen Glassa to run that through production, see if that would change it. It did have some changes and they were like, well, we can't, this is not sustainable. We can't be bringing water all the way from Glen Rothes to Glen Glassa. So why don't we take the 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 mash from Glen Glassa and we'll ferment that at Glen Rothes. So they're trying all these different <laughs> things, um, running Glen Rothes's wash through the stills at Glen Glassa, and they were like, well, yes, no, sometimes this doesn't work, mm. sometimes it does work. This is kind of what we want, also not what we really want. This is not sustainable, and that was kind of what played Glen Glassa was that it in a, if the single malt market had been what it is today back then, Glen Glassa would have had a field day. Um, but sadly, it wasn't, and so it just got closed, and it got closed in 1986 or so. And so it's um, it was fairly sad, and again, it just could not find its niche in the marketplace, especially in blends. But um, a lot of older vintages were kept by the distillery, kept by Highland distillers, and um, that was kind of slowly drip-fed into the private bottling arena, and people slowly got to know. I mean, I say slowly. People don't really know what Glen Glass <laughs> is. Luck if you've been, if you've lucky enough to try some of that older vintage, older yeah. stock, phenomenal stuff. It really is, um, and it kind of piqued people's awareness off this distillery. So, um, going on from then, it was closed obviously for a couple of decades until we had 2008 roll around. And again, if you're reading that book by Ian Buxton, he's a consultant. He's kind of like a writes a lot about whiskey, does a lot of marketing for distilleries. He meets up with a man named Stuart Nickerson, who's a master distiller, but at that time was being a consultant. 
he um he essentially is working Stuart Nickerson is working with investors I think from Russia they were in like some sort of like Russian energy um kind of area and they were really into their single malts and they really wanted to uh, revive an old distillery and they were and at that time in Scotland you know 2000s 2008 a lot of people were throwing money into mm-hmm. distilleries because obviously we're starting to see this rise and this boom but a lot of people were not surviving <laughs> it takes not only a lot of money to buy distillery it's an incredible investment that you have to constantly be injecting money to get it up and running to create that stock to leave that stock to sit on that <laughs> stock and then eventually release it it's just a lot so a lot of people were flopping were going in there thinking they could do it so it was quite a kind of interesting time for the scotch whiskey industry but glenglass uh, i think these guys were really really committed and highland distillers especially at that time they wouldn't have just given they, they'd actually vet apparently who they sell to um they really do want to make sure that this distillery any distillery they sell is going into the hands of someone that will one pay for it also be able to maintain it also be able to actually just constantly give it the injection um, money and love that it actually needs to get going. So they were clearly vetted by Highland Distillers. They got the sale. Stuart Nickerson got to work. First couple of years were really just trying to sell some of that older stock to refurbish the distillery and build it back to its former glory because there were holes in the dunnage. There was some (laughs) copper missing from some of the pieces because some people had gotten in there and cut pieces out sold it for scrap so it was in a very sorry state back in that time um but it has gone from strength to strength and now well 2008 we see it kind of come onto the scene in 2009 um Stuart Nickerson releases some spirit that is just essentially new make spirit some of it was aged for six months some of it was peated some of it was unpeated um had some quirky names as well like the spirits whose name we shall not say (laughs) things like that um interesting yeah. but it was just giving a little peek into what glen glasser was going to be and it even that stuff if you ever find that that it came in kind of like half size yeah. bottles and they were sold in a three pack and they were fantastic tasting spirit it wasn't yeah. whiskey but it was to then be whiskey of course so if so, you see yeah. the bottles of 30 and 40 year old those are from the highland distillers days those are, yeah, okay. absolutely. Yeah, so that's not and from Brown Foreman's days. That's not from Billy Walker days. Stuart Nickerson's so you're basically not. tasting uh, a single malt that nobody else, even then, was tasting because they were still trying to make these things work for blends. And So what happened with these exactly. barrels? They just sat in this warehouse unattended, or uh, we, we had a security guard standing by just to make sure nobody <laughs> – I mean, I mean, how does that all... There was a security guard. Yeah, I know I had the same question because, you know, obviously when you've got people going in and, and cutting chunks of <laughs> copper out of your mash tun and things like that, you're like, well, you know, who's there to stop them? But there was a security guard on, on call there um, throughout the years. And it's a long period to yeah. have, you know, a, a, a security guard to be going around. But yeah, I mean, probably just one guy going around just making sure everything's okay and shining a flashlight in. But a lot of those casks would have sat in the warehouse a lot of them may be moved as well to other areas just to keep them safe as they matured because i mean obviously that's just a prize spot for people coming in and siphoning some whiskey out but um yeah under lock and key but like i said some of those dunnage warehouses were not in a good state there were like i said the roof was collapsed so they had to rebuild the entire Mm. roof and so i'm sure the whiskey wasn't sitting in that area but uh, more of a secure spot and they probably had to move it around if it was in disrepair so yeah um it has come around uh, when you go there. I mean, if you go back, I hope you do go back to Glen Glassa and we'll try and get you in when it's <laughs> open. But uh, it's amazing. It really is a phenomenal distillery. And, uh, of course, it ties into the rest of the distilleries that Glendronic and Ben Reek, Billy Walker, um, has set up the Ben Reek Distilling Company in the early 2000s. He buys Glendronic in 2007. He then buys Glen Glassa in 2013. And um, yeah, he he starts releasing whiskey from that uh, distillery. So now it's of age. I think Revival at this point, at that point, was already really out. Um, It just hit the shelves. Billy Walker buys it. um, And then we start releasing other whiskeys like Evolution. And then uh, Torfa comes out as well. So even if you... Actually, Well, I was going to say, if you were tasting the stuff uh, that he released, the new stuff has to be completely different. I mean, it has to be... Yeah, I mean, because it's had so much more time in the cask now, so it's getting full influence. Totally different. It real. Oh gosh, yeah. Um, yeah. Let's do uh, evolution actually. Yeah, let's because uh, we're talking about the the spirit style and 
this is going to be one that will really give Oof. you a good idea of what the spirit style is. And again, this is going to be more leading towards that space side style yeah. as opposed to the revival, which is more of that Highland style. So expect lots of. Fruit. Okay, so this is funny because uh, power of suggestion. Um, mm. I initially, when I started reading the the bottle, it said that it has a barrels used t a, a ex Tennessee whiskey. So my first thought mm -hmm. on it went to well brown foreman i know which distillery this is but then i thought wait mm -hmm. this was before brown foreman ownership and so i sort of when i was nosing it i was like am i getting like that flintstone vitamin smell it's like my brain was throwing me towards a george <laughs> dickel kind of a of a smell so yeah so there is a combination i mean obviously we should all assume those casks now are coming from yeah. the McDaniels now, the Brown Foreman Distillery owns. Um, yep, uh, both those distilleries. But yeah, um, certainly when you go into the warehouse uh, back then, it would have been a combination of Jack casks and most likely possibly Dickel casks as well because <laughs> you were just buying whatever you can get your hands yeah. on, really. It's um, nice to see them working yeah. together. <laughs> I, I know, absolutely. I know, right? It's the only time that would yes. ever really happen. <laughs> But yes, you're right though. Um, there is a real kind of minerality to that, and there's also that real. And I, I, there's a lot of fruit in here that we can talk about. But the first thing that I really get going on in here, and this was a pairing that I actually did. And if you're ever at home and trying this, um, banana Foster ice cream, oh, is what okay. I really get it is vanilla yeah. bean. It is tropical fruits, and you're really getting into. You can get deeper into that. You can go mango, yeah. papaya, but really banana pops out and of course that's a classic tennis yeah exactly right well and that that was um, part of why i wondered if uh i'm like i'm getting one but i'm getting the other at the same time because the banana was really strong and I, so my brain was starting to say no you're not you're this is just power of suggestion you're you're pulling it in but i mean it does have kind of like a somewhere between a creme brulee meets banana kind yep. of a, a note to it that uh it's really really nice it really is. Um, it's fresh as well. It's quite, again, citrusy, but not in the lemon aspect. It's more of that kind of almost pineapple, almost very mango, tropical, that kind yes. of level of citrus. Yes. Very tropical, very lush, and quite oily as well. And I will say that this is actually, this was the last release. So it went Revival, Torfa, Evolution. So this is actually going to be the youngest out of the trio. I don't know what bottling date you have there. I think mine is coming in at, let's see what we've got here. 2017 so this is actually fairly young whiskey you're probably looking at like maybe five years old um six years old with this whiskey um give or take depending on the bottling date of course and so again this is why we called it evolution because we knew that all of these expressions including this one would evolve over time every time we've added it every time yeah. we bottled it and um that is a testament to the quality of spirit if you can drink something that is exclusively aged in one cast so you're not kind of hiding um the spirit from uh, from the consumer with cask types and all that. This is bare bones Glenglassa. Mm. This is essentially what is an ex-bourbon barrel. It's an ex-American whiskey cask. Of course, we do say that it is exclusively Tennessee yeah. cask, which does give you a little bit more idea of where these flavors are coming from. But there's no hiding in there. There, You have to have a good spirit. And the fact that that is drinkable at 50% mm -hmm. ABV, 100 proof. There's very few single malts that could do one cask type, 100 proof, and at that age, that young age point, and still be yeah. enjoyable. Um, I mean, of course, we can enjoy it and we can appreciate whiskeys that are perhaps that young. We can appreciate where it's going to go and how it's going to be. But for what it is, that Glenglassa evolution is just I was phenomenal. reading, too, that it, really it seems like they apparently had a higher proof on it initially because I saw someone who had mm -hmm. it at 57%. Yeah, so I think the the earlier bottlings that because it even had a different label as well. There was kind of a a green label that then had I think it was a yellow bar running along the bottom that said Evolution. Um, and now we've kind of gone with this kind of grey scale um, label there with a, a cask in the background overlooking the ocean. Um, and yeah, it would have been maybe perhaps a, I think it was a slightly higher ABV back then. So it, again, pff, yeah, no yeah, confidence, right? If you can even go higher exactly. than fifty and it's younger. That's, uh, that's well, impressive. That was the first so. one, too, that I, um, besides the next one, that I caught that kind of mm. briny saltiness, too. Yeah. It, uh, and it's on the finish. It's like it after you've is. been sitting there, yep. you go, oh, yeah, it does. I, I'm getting that kind of sea influence in there, which is really nice. It's, unexpe it's unexpected. It's unexpected. Really if, if somebody's a, um, 
I mean, I've had Old Pulteney, and Old Pulteney is briny all the way from beginning to mm-hmm. to finish. And so to have it kind of sneak in there at the end is a is a really interesting uh, way for it to go. You pick it right at the back of the tongue. It's on the it's right at the back, left and right side as well. And it's it is strange because again we said this before, but it is quite a sweet style um, that Glen Glasser makes. So to go from that very viscous, oily, sweet note, and then suddenly you get this little little kind of hint of yeah. C note, um, the salinity, this brininess. It is really interesting. So again, um, yeah, I'm so excited. I'm so excited to see what this distillery does and what direction it goes in because so far the whiskey that we've created is just so good. And so once we get of age, it will yes. be fantastic. So now yeah. this is the one. Have you got the this is the one in? that yeah. It's like I got to get there. <laughs> yes. I, I was I was uh, mentioning before we started recording that uh, I bought this about three weeks ago, four weeks ago, and if you look at my bottle, it is uh, it's at the halfway point, <laughs> and it's very unusual for me to just really get hooked on a, a whiskey and and look at my shelves and go, nope, nope, I want this one tonight, I want this one tonight because mm-hmm. uh, this one, this one to me from nose to finish uh for somebody who loves peated whiskey uh, this this one just fits because it's got, you've got that you've got the peach you got a little brininess to it it's not medicinal um so for those people who maybe turn their nose at Isla whiskey because it's medicinal this is more like a a foresty kind of a um yep. smoke that comes to this and the caramel is so nice in this. It is. This is definitely a rich. I called it a salted caramel uh, whiskey when I first tasted it. A nice smoky caramel whiskey, and I thought that was like everything that if you handed it to somebody and you wanted them to have that know what they were about to be tasting, that that would kind of nail the the top end of this. It does. It ticks all the boxes in what I want for. Uh, peated whiskey. Sometimes I do want that really medicinal, coastal kind of classic yeah. Isla note. But this is, I think, perfect for people that are maybe new to peat. I have maybe smelled or tried and been put off by Isla, Isla styles that can be really aggressive. Um, like you said, this isn't medicinal. This isn't that. And again, this isn't a, a, a knock at all, but that kind of medicinal band-aid yeah. iodine note that we typically associate with isla whiskies again not all are like that but that's kind of the classic style that we expect from that um this is wood-based peat this is and we'll get to this with bin Riek, which is again it's a space side distillery very close to glen glass that makes peated whiskey but in my opinion the torfa is probably the best representation of what highland peat is it is not offensive mm-hmm. it is things that we know and love it's bonfires campfires it's wood burning stoves it's bonfires on the beach it really is just such a beautiful whiskey and then the sweetness coming in on top of that takes away from the aggressive nature that you might have with some peated whiskies it adds in that caramel we're using bourbon and some sherry casks in this so lovely sweet notes vanilla notes you're getting smoked vanilla bean coming through there and then of course that caramel note mm. as well that you're talking about and the fruit's all there as well if you dive a little deeper you do almost get that kind of like kind of like uh, fruit salad syrup it's almost like a combination and it almost has that kind of gummy nature as well and you find that in the evolution and you find it in the torfa it's almost like yeah campfire fruit salad which sounds bizarre <laughs> but yeah it's that kind of it's that yeah. thing but it's so there. buttery i get little bacon notes in mm. there and then the fullness of it and then what's interesting is that when it first gets on your palate the smoke really isn't the first thing that i notice but it evolves so beautifully it's like it just rolls right in there and uh and mm-hmm. completes the experience and then it just lingers with you it's like it's like you're wandering through a forest uh af- after totally you're done does. it's oh, amazing yeah. how it and and there is kind of a you're right there's sort of that um i get sort of that apple stone fruit kind of a thing going on in there and it's it, it's there but uh but you kind of have mm-hmm. to have to hunt for it a little bit you do you do have to kind of get through the the initial kind of caramel buttery i think buttery is a great descriptor for these whiskies especially mm-hmm. torfa um, and that's actually, this is why I mentioned I had kind of a pairing program um, where it was kind of pairing up Scottish confectionery items. This, any peated whiskey really actually goes well with mint. 
Um, mint just kind of livens the palette up and it just changes smoke to being almost like fresh embers mm. it's like a very not intense it's not making it more intense certainly but it's freshening that smoke up and mint infused shortbread which obviously is very buttery in its nature and sweet that is so good with this um this whiskey it is gorgeous stuff or smoked salmon or any sort of seafood this is phenomenal with it is just such a great whiskey and again it's 50 yeah. percent it's not old it's young spirit and uh, peated whiskey and spirit typically tends to be a bit more aggressive on the younger side yeah. anyway um but gentle buttery creamy these are all descriptors that i would attribute to the so, torfa so what um, do you think that uh in terms of the three distilleries we talked about this a little bit during the glendronic episode but um we see ben Riach is maybe more the experimental side where would where would we put Glendronic is this something? I mean, uh, uh, Glenglassa is this? Is this something that when uh, Dr. Rachel Berry comes in and she's she's looking at it, she's going again. Here's another one that kind of has its own personality. Let's not mess with it too much and just maybe enhance it here or there. Yeah, um, certainly from the single cask releases, we have seen some really eclectic stuff and actually being back there three weeks ago there is just a real range of cast types that glenglassa has that some people might know about um if you know glenglassa well but i think from what we've even seen here we've seen bourbon sherry um and we've seen you know obviously even tennessee whiskey casks and red wine casks so there's some cool stuff going on there but in the warehouse we have octaves we have masandra casks which i don't know if you've mm -hmm. ever heard of masandra casks but from um this was from back when it was reopened in 2008 2009 we had um those russian investors that were um kind of revived the distillery with stuart nickerson uh, they were able to get their hands on crimean wine casks and so Massandra is essentially a kind of um it denotes to and actually it was funny i was doing a, a tasting with a journalist who happened to be from um the former uh ussr and she was saying oh yeah Massandra, i know what mm. that is and she explained essentially that this was wine that was made in the crimea it was sherry style it was port style it was madeira style and it was all kind of these fortified wines that you legally couldn't call sherry port Madeira, Masan uh, so they called it Masandra, was the kind hmm. of style. And so it was like a sherry style cask made in the USSR. Obviously, they weren't trading with Western Europe, so they made their own. And some of these casks, and I was looking at them, and they are crazy looking. <laughs> they are unlike any shape huh. you've ever seen. Um, they're all warped. It, the best descriptor I could really come up with it was that it looks like old ship wood, like old, old, like big thick planks that are being used as staves they're all crazy and warped and bubbled and but they're still holding and some of these casks they would have reused them for hundreds of years um and this is what the czar would have commissioned and he would kind of go around and you know possibly even touched by the yeah. czar um and these are how old these casks are and the whiskeys coming out of those at Glenglasa were just so stunning, so different, so herbaceous, so syrupy, not overly sweet, but so complex and herbaceous. Very huh. interesting. So there's a real collection of stuff at Glenglasa. <laughs> um, Dira Marsala casks um, that we'll see coming out. Um, hopefully, again, there's some things going on behind the background there that uh, I think we'll, we'll see some changes at Glenglasa soon enough and maybe start to see some fun things rolled out. Who yeah. knows? But yeah, um, lots of things happening. So we do see Ben Rake as the eclectic distillery and there's lots of reasons to obviously believe that it's, it is a very eclectic distillery. But Glenglasa has some quirks. I think we it's 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 easy when you've got a portfolio to put distilleries mm -hmm. in a box and see Glendronic as this is the sherry distillery, Ben Rake's the kind of eclectic distillery. Glenglassa will find its feet, but it's so exciting because we don't quite know the direction it's going to go in. But historically speaking, it would have been peated um, because back in, you know, even when you're, there's interviews with Stuart Nickerson, they're reading old accounts of the distillery. They were collecting peat from the moor locally by and they were obviously stacking all these massive like 400 stacks, 400 ton stacks of peat. And so that whiskey would have traditionally been peated most, you know, like most whiskies in the Highlands at that time. So Stuart Nickerson definitely wanted to have a peated whiskey at Glenglassa, hence why they were looking at creating Torfa. Obviously, it was released under Billy Walker. But that is what Glenglassa really, that's the closest historically it would have been um, to the traditional whiskey made at the distillery. Everything else is just yeah, a bonus, yeah. really.
So Thanks. I am looking forward to the future because I'm already marking this down as the distillery to watch because it really, they, this is some great stuff. So, Talk to all right, you. so let's move on from the glens to the bends. <laughs> bends, absolutely. Um, so we are going to pivot a wee bit, yeah, to another distillery. So let's start. Um, now you've got the 10 there, this have you? This is the 10 original. And Fantastic. so when we when so, we call this original, we're calling it that for what reason? So, it, actually, I actually happened to have I was before this uh, this podcast. I was like, oh, I really want to show him this. So again, I know you record <laughs> this on video. So if you do happen to be watching this via video, but I will describe it to you. So what I actually have here in my hands is what is the original ten. Um, so to jump straight into the timeline but we'll go back in yeah. more depth but just to give you a little um snippet of this what this is is essentially back in 18 and 18 gosh 1990s um in 1996 we had been re released its first single malt scotch whiskey it always been producing single malt but that single malt was going to mm. blended scotches so this was the first time it ever released its own single malt under its own banner and if i pick up the tube that i have here this was actually the inspiration for what is our new packaging. So this kind of duck egg, egg I was a duck blue kind of egg shell um, tones that we have here was the inspiration for our original oh, okay. ten. So it has gone through some some iterations. So we had this in the 1990s. We had a Billy Walker design, which was very different. I've got some older bottlings. I'll show you. Um, and so this was the inspiration yeah. um the original 10 and hence why we call it that although it is quite different from what that 10 year old would have been like um back in the 1990s but the original 10 does consist of three or sorry three casks that which i'll be talking a lot about um each of our core range does include a combination of three different cask styles it is bourbon virgin american oak and sherry cask and that'll be a combination of oloroso and pedro okay. Jimenez. so it is quite for a 10 year old being our kind of flagship yeah. whiskey what we should expect is really just bringing all of what we should expect from ben Rieg together and it really is this is what i would say is a classic space so single. i was so trying to put my finger on yesterday when i first knows this uh, and i figured it out it's it's strawberry shortcake yeah. Oh gosh, that's a great descriptor. Absolutely. It's just, it does. Yeah. It's got yeah. it's got a little bit of the the grain. It's got the strawberry. It's got the uh, kind of vanilla um, creaminess to it, a little custard, totally maybe some banana in there. Mm hmm. These are not descriptors that we would socially, I think, immediately associate with a ten year yeah. either. This is something that we would maybe attribute to more of a mature whiskey. Yeah. And this is a 10 year old as it stands is got some complexity to it. And like you said, some people more generally speaking, but you're right. I give that is great descriptor. Strawberry uh, shortcake is fantastic. <laughs> exactly what you're talking about. A lot of people get apples yeah. and pears. I mean, they get kind of crisp red apple. They get They'll some get of that. Of yeah. Stewed down pears yeah. as well. Honey. We get the it classic really space. I know it's lemon it's a, as well. It's amazing yeah. how many di different directions this goes and they're all, but it all works beautifully together. It does. Um, bourbon, of course, adding vanilla, honey sweetness, virgin American oak, giving us some of that spice, which you'll find on the palate. It gives you a lovely bit of oak spice mm -hmm. coming through. And then the sherry casks kind of being the, the I guess, the the, the, the the string that ties it all together, I think. You don't quite get a lot of sherry coming through here. You might get whispers of chocolate, perhaps, on the finish, um, potentially coming from the sherry casks but really it's just kind of softening everything that's going in there um kind of rounding out some of the edges i tend to get but more really of the is. grain on the on the palate when i it's got a really mm -hmm. a, a very pleasant um grain flavor that comes through it does and the barley note uh, here is that kind of crisp and clean sugary note and i think a lot of people when you talk about grain notes it sometimes seems a negative but actually in this it's a lovely barley sugar snap yeah. sweetness which actually runs through all of the mm. ben reeks you'll find that even if it's you look into the older age statements and that's partially attributed to the fact that we have a four water mash at ben reek so we do have our signature water mash which is um, comprised of four waters as opposed to the traditional three so we're not wasting any of the residual sugars in those uh, in that malted barley grist and so you do find that comes through in the whiskey 
as because remember the the third water in your mash typically then goes into being your first water in your new batch yeah. of grists. So there will be residual sugars in the first water, but Ben Reik, the first and the second water will have residual sugars from the previous mash. So you will have a higher concentration of sugars when you go next door for fermentation, giving you that sweetness, giving you all that lovely acidification that then takes place. So yeah, you do get that kind of malted barley grain sweetness coming through, which I love. And it's just it's fresh. This is up. not going to be a knock. This is going to be more of a plus on what we just tasted. Do you tend to do, if you're going to taste both these brands together, these two distilleries, do you put Ben Reich first usually? Because this it's like the other was so milky and and so yes. buttery that Very I jump thick. over to this and I'm like, mm. it's got a nice body to it, but it actually feels, you're kind of like, it's thinner. <laughs> it's Yeah, it is. It's much more, I mean, it's a medium bodied, but that's what we try to go for at Ben is more of that yeah. medium bodied style. And this is like night and day compared to the two distilleries. I mean, Glenglassa is mm-hmm. heavy. It is rich. It is full bodied. Um, and you really get, and Milky is a great descriptor there as well, yeah. And Ben Riet going to that, it's a little bit, again, you're just removing some of that, you're crispening it up, you're freshening it up. Um, and yeah, it's a bit more of a, I'd say, kind of going from like, this is like springtime. And then obviously Glen Glass is like going into like a tumble <laughs> into wintery, kind of that yeah. bodied, rich nature. Absolutely. Yeah, it really is. Well, let's. Now, one thing I want to mention here, real quick, is if you ever do pick up a bottle of Ben Riek, what you will find, where did my bottle, here we go, is the new label change that we have here. One of the things that is the most, I would say, I think for consumers that are maybe new to single malts or people that are just interested in what's going into their whiskey, this little label on the bottom underneath the main header will tell you everything you need to know that's going in there. The cask mm. makeup, the first cask listed will be the most dominant cask, and the smoke level is really key. And in the original 10, I don't know if we took a wee peek at it, but the smoke level in the original 10 is actually trace. Okay. So we used to have in our core lineup, we used to have a peated line and an unpeated classic line. And we actually also have a triple distilled line as well, which we can yeah. talk about later. We don't have any of that on display, but the smoke level has now been incorporated into the new range to basically give um, a bit more nuance to what's going on. And in the original 10, we have tweaked it slightly. It's the same cast makeup as the last 10 under Billy Walker. But now we've actually incorporated a trace amount of peated whiskey stock in there. So maybe it's 100 casks, let's say we're using. Um, maybe a handful of those casks will be peated. So you're not going to really get it. I, I picked, I did, actually. I, and, I, and I was yeah. thinking, is this because I just had the Torfa? But well, you're, you but you're right. This, no, was, I, this lingered it after. There. It was on the finish. It wasn't really during... Um, you know, while it was on the palate, it was as it was clearing out that I picked up just a hint of smoke on there. Just a yeah. hint. And some people don't even pick up at all. I mean, people that are particularly sensitive or know that's, that taste or are yeah. looking for it will definitely pick it up. But yeah, uh, it comes out after or sometimes you get little hints of it on the nose there. But it is so subtle, trace amount. So before so, before we yeah. jump into the history, let's go ahead and move on to the original 12 since we're, yeah, since that. we're um, basically... We'll go non semi non peated to peated as uh, as we get uh, <laughs> out of our story. So well, the good thing about the twelve is actually that this is actually nil smoke. Okay. Level, so we are not adding any smoke into this at all. There is no peated whiskey stocks being brought in. And very interesting that you're using uh, different barrels for this. Are you using the same sherry? Uh, blend basically for uh, what you're doing with the sherries? PX Oloroso is what we'll typically use. It'll be more leaning on the Oloroso okay. side than the PX. Um, that will typically be probably sent to Glendronic more than Benrig, but we do certainly have PX casks at, bo- at all three yeah. distilleries. But yeah, it will be a combination probably leaning more on the Oloroso, but we will have some PX there to boost up that sweetness. But yes, um, the first cask used in this, the most dominant cask, will be sherry. And so a lot of people looked at us, I think, when we released a 10 and a 12 range. They were like, really? Is there that much <laughs> difference? Should you know what? Maybe just kind of gone in on the 12? Because when you look at kind of whiskey sales and for single malt Scotch whiskey, 12 is the kind of golden number to have as your your flagship. So Ben Rieux always historically had a 10, so it made sense that we kept that. But there is a 
significant difference um, in 10 and 12. Of course, we're using a different cask makeup. We are slightly tweaking it in that this is 100% unpeated in the 12, opposed to the trace. We are incorporating mm -hmm. sherry, bourbon, and port casks in this. And so you are going to get quite a different dimension. And the way that I describe this compared to the 10 is that we are essentially taking that fresh fruit that we had the strawberries that you found there the apples the pears the lemon zest um, the apricot we're just kind of melting it down we're going to be roasting it down we're caramelizing those sugars if there are any fresh fruits it might be more in the realm of i'd maybe say like some red berry kind of like almost like chocolate dark what is it black forest gato mm. that kind of like dark chocolate and raspberries and blackberries and things like that um but this is again quite leaning on the sweeter side of the spectrum here. No smoke whatsoever. A little higher ABV on it. And then what is your process for the barrels? Are you basically blending three different, four different barrels together? Or are you uh, blending two and then maybe aging them a little longer in something else? What? How does that work for you guys? So good question. A lot of people think we move whiskey from one cast to the next. We are actually just vatting the different casts okay. together because it's much easier for a master blender. Um, Dr. Rachel Barry, who's at the helm for Glendronic, which we talked about, Glen Glassa and Ben Riek, um, under her wing of protection. And she actually is obviously working with different samples from different casks. She's taking those samples from the warehouse down to her lab in Edinburgh. She's mixing them up. And um, once she's kind of got her, her vat secured and ready she will then just give them the sheets to work with up at the yeah. distillery and they will pick the casks work in the ratios create the vat and that will get sent down to edinburgh for bottling so um very rarely will we move the cask uh, whiskey from one cask to another and it's really if something's gone wrong or if it's too much oak influence or not enough we'll move it so um but in most of the especially in the younger whiskies we don't really have that problem and we can kind of blend those inconsistencies out yeah. if we need to yeah. I'm actually getting more of the uh, more of the apple kind of notes out of this. Yeah, yeah. It's almost like apple pie notes. Yeah. You're kind of getting that cinnamon. You're getting that almost sugar note as well. But it's like the it's the meat of not the meat. It's the fruit, I guess, of yeah. the apple pie. Yeah. It's that kind of um, yeah baked mm -hmm. stewed apple. Yeah, and that's that's really the signature note at Benrique is orchard okay. fruits. It's what we typically expect at Space Side Distilleries. But yeah, orchard fruits. Or what we find running across the line, whether it's unpeated or peated, it'll just come through in different dimensions. I think whether it's fresh, stewed, mm. oven roasted, whatever it is, um, or kind of campfire roasted or whatever Ooh. with some smoke in Ooh. there. But... <laughs> I'm getting something mm. I wasn't getting before. Um, I get a, I, it's almost like it's that, that grain is there and then all of a sudden the, the like this chocolate just takes over on it. That's what I was talking about with the kind of the wow. gato. The um yeah dark chocolate kind of dark mm -hmm. forest black forest gato it comes out right in there because it gives you all that fruit suddenly some someone comes along with a a kind of big thick little water yeah. chocolate there and it's just right at the oh, back it's powerful of the yeah it's lovely yeah. Mm -hmm. very nice and it lingers Sherry right influence. through it does that's beautiful it really does again I think um we have had historically a twelve at Ben Riek, but we haven't had one for a very long time in our core range and this is what this one this is the billy walker okay. era of um of labeling so this is what the old 12 would have looked like it's kind of a white label um the distillery itself is kind of outlined except that uh, it's kind of a, a red outline for the 12 and other expressions have different colors of um of distillery um kind of shading so um i'm glad we've moved away from this packaging because it definitely looks like it has dated <laughs> a little bit but uh you've got to always homage uh take homage on where your history is coming absolutely. from absolutely um so yes. let's jump so, back because uh this is a younger distillery than uh glenn glassa it started in 1898 mm -hmm. which would have been a bad time to start a distillery because i think yes. uh, the number i read was there were 33 distilleries that were built in scotland that year and that the patterson bubble was just about to burst on the scotch whiskey industry and so um but interesting to read also that it appears that john duff who was the the founder actually worked for glenn Dronick before he worked for uh, Ben Rick. He did. And we don't know a lot. There's I've, I've done a lot of research into John Duff and we've kind of 
confirmed and questioned a lot of what he did um, in his life because he had quite a life it sounded like um like he said he did he was um one of the managers at glendronic distillery which is crazy to think about where <laughs> we are now obviously they're all under the same ownership um and yeah he was the founder of ben Reek. he also went over to north america went over to kentucky which again is funny now that we think about brown foreman being a kentucky <laughs> company um we don't really have much of the records of what he did in kentucky he then went to south africa as well don't know quite what he was doing there <laughs> i think he was working within whiskey in some capacity but, um, but i don't think it really worked out returned to scotland and set up longmore distillery followed by um ben Reek as well and it's i mean longmore and if you know where longmore is it's stones throw away literally you can walk to longmore from the last warehouse at ben Reek, and it would probably take you five minutes if that three minutes to get to Longmore yeah. distillery um yeah so he he built he was our founder he built that and it was like he said the worst time you could have built a distillery so the pattison's crash that bubble burst uh, about a third of the distilleries were either closed or mothballed some to, some of them never to return um and ben Reek got caught up in that as well as glen glassa of course as well but i think ben Reek being a little bit more sad because it had only been open for two years before it was closed in 1900 uh so it hadn't even a chance to really release any whiskey stocks at that point um but it's uh it is kind of a more modern distillery when we think of distilleries you know 18 you know 18 uh 26 being glendronic and then 1875 being glenglassa that's really kind of we're thinking about old style distilleries but really turn of the century when we think about it that's a fairly modern distillery so they knew what they were really doing at that point and ben Reek historically has actually been the training site for many distillers mm. that were starting their their time in the industry uh to really get a handle on how to operate a distillery because you can really have one guy doing everything at Ben Reek. You really don't need a lot of people. It's all clockwise, um, the way it's built. I mean, talking yeah. about modern day, this is like kind of like looking into like the 80s and 90s here. Um, but it's built clockwise, so you're moving from um, the malt floor, going into the maltings, going into uh, the milling room, going from that to the mash tun, fermentation room, distillation, then out into the warehouse. It's a really good visual. You're not kind of going from one place to the next. Glenglassa can be a wee bit like that where you're kind of in one area and you have to go through the still room to get to another area. So there's a lot of kind of underground little kind of shoots and pulleys and pools that kind of drag things around. But Ben Reek's very straightforward, very well built. And so it was used as a training facility for a long time for um, distillers and uh, trainee blenders and things to kind of get a handle of what was going on there. But um, yeah, so it was closed 1900 and really the saving grace that uh, kind of enabled ben Reek to survive was its malt floors so it was used from 1900 to 1965 not for making whiskey but purely from the owners at the time just to malt mm -hmm. barley because that had been you know all the facilities were new um possibly their warehouse space was also utilized to house some whiskey but really it was making money as being basically a maltster and surviving, supplying malt to the surrounding distilleries. And like I said, there's lots of distilleries in that area, so it makes sense to be doing oh, uh, that. And well, I was going to hear, I heard that uh, they actually had a train that went between the mm -hmm. two distilleries, Longmorn and, uh, and Ben Rhea. A wee puggy, <laughs> yeah. And actually, it would go up to Glen Lossy as well, which is um, very close to, um, the, also built by John okay. Duff as well. So there's three distilleries that are almost in a little triangle. Obviously, Longmore and Ben Reek are very close, but I didn't even realize until I was there three weeks ago, but that train used to actually go up and around to, it kind of connected the three distilleries. And um, it would obviously take casks, grist, whatever was needed, malted barley um, to and from. And it was even in the local papers and things because it was quite... Again, perfect kind of going into the you know we're Victorian era whatever coming out of that phase. This is really kind of you know steam engines of the hot craze. So um, to build them between three distilleries was like seen as a real um, kind well, of innovation, and so people really interesting at it. to see. We would assume that they would build distilleries away from each other, but when I went to a Strathspey Distillery, if you walk behind it, Glen Keith is right there. So it's like they built them right yeah. on top of each other. They were. I mean, at that time in Scotland, they were just popping them up as much. That's unprecedented. I mean, that would never happen now. Although they are building a lot of new distilleries, um, they were popping up all yeah. over the place. Um, it was a real time to get in on that industry, hence why Ben Reek was built. But who could have 
seen what was going to happen in two years after that. So, yeah, very sad that some of these distilleries got closed. But you're right. Um, there are some great photographs and pictures of the train um, going between the distilleries and arriving at Ben Reik with uh, lots of different materials. So, yeah, very interesting. It, it got purchased at some point by Glenn Livett. So what time period would that have been? We're looking at kind of during the crash. So they would have um, owned it throughout the 19, into the 1965. Um, they were owning it. So then you had, that was when it was reopened in the 1960s. Um, and it started producing really just exclusively for blended scotch mm. whiskies. You would not have seen Ben Reek being sold as a single malt, even as the industry started to actually bottle and sell to the wider market for single malts. And that's kind of where Ben Reek was. It was the whisper in the blend. It was known as um, whiskey stocks that were just kind of being made by Ben Reek of varying styles. It was kind of almost seen as the the larder for blenders to go to, um, especially if Isla whiskies were running out of stock Ben Reik was always there. From 1972, they started creating some peated stocks, um, as well as their classic unpeated style of Speyside whiskey. And so they really had it all. And when you walk into the warehouse there, you see it is a hodgepodge of different cask types, different codes that mean it's unpeated or peated or triple distilled or double distilled. Um, it really is a larder. And that's actually how our master blender, uh, Dr. Rachel Barry, talks about it. She talks about going into that and she can pick and choose, <laughs> and that's what she's done with our new core range, is that she can see, she's obviously gone in there and gone, port casks, Oloroso, Pedro Jimenez, Virgin Oak, Bourbon, I'll take some peated whiskey, I'll sneak that in there. It's just amazing. It must be like a blender's field day <laughs> to go in there and just see what stocks we have. And we've been doing that historically for for wow. decades. And yeah. you guys actually did uh, triple distilling at one point. We did. We started doing that, I think we did that in 19... 1990s um we started doing that where essentially we were running it for a third time through our stills and nowadays that whiskey is only really used for travel mm. retail so you will see expressions with, i'm not sure how much we're doing that right now but i have to admit i did see it when i was going through the airport in scotland there is a triple distilled um edition of ben Reik there i believe it's bourbon virgin and sherry and it's lovely i've actually had it before um I, but it is a little bit kind of cleaner um obviously you're removing a lot of the, the character from your whiskey as you distill further and further times but um it's lovely whiskey and again it just kind of brightens it lightens it crispens it up a little bit more um but again that's just a testament to how eclectic that distillery is so you can imagine when we started making single malt under our own banner it was just a yeah um a field day for a blender to go into and just yeah so as we jump towards the peated um, was yes. was Ben Reich making peated whiskey that came late to the game? So it, in that beginning of the 20th century and then weren't distilling for a long time. So the question is, were they ever doing a peated whiskey? So they would, uh, well, they wouldn't have obviously with being closed yeah. for such a long time. So this was kind of new for Ben Reich in the 1970s. But historically speaking, this would have been the style of whiskey made in that um, 19th century style, which would have been peated whiskey in the Highlands, in Speyside. It was just the thing to do. You had to have peat um, to malt your barley. So it was no exception that Ben Reik, if it had been, you know, obviously not closed, if it, would, it was continued making whiskey for when it was um, set up, we probably would have had peated whiskey there. So we're returning to a style that we never historically made, but returning to a style of whiskey that Speyside would have mm. known back in the day. Um, but of course, being Ben Reik, it has its own little flair on this. And we do continue to use Highland peat in our whiskey stocks. So I do actually have a piece here. I'm not sure if you can see this on camera. Oh, yeah. But this is actually a piece of peat taken from nice. Ben Reich. And uh, for those of you not looking at the camera, this has essentially in it embedded. This is, I couldn't have picked a perfect piece. I'm going to be totally awesome. And I'm surprised I got it through <laughs> um, security. I'm not sure what foreign soil you can take through. But um, pieces of wood, pieces of pine, um, pieces of um, you know decaying plant life. And obviously in that part of Scotland in the northeast, historically there would have been Caledonian pine forest there. And so when you take a cross section off this peat, burn it, malt the barley, and then subsequently make it into whiskey, you're going to taste that fauna that is in there. And so the peat style, and we found it a little in Torfa, but even in Ben Reik, it's a real fresh smoke. And you'll find it in that um, smoky 10. It is 
pine, it's eucalyptus, it's that, but with an edge yeah. of smoke. Um, and it's also really nice. This one uses bourbon, virgin, and rum casks in here. So again, three cask styles. Um, the inclusion of rum being quite unusual, even virgin cask still being quite unusual now to be in a core item. And this is a tweaked version of what is or what was the Ben Reik 10 Curiositas, okay. which was we had Latin names for all of our older peated stocked whiskey at Ben Reik. So this was a slight tweak. We've added virgin and rum casks and we've added in some unpeated stocks into this as well to kind of add more of that signature style at Ben Reik, more of the fruit and maybe just mellowing out that smoke a bit more than it being a, the full whack, the full 100% peated stocks going truth, in there. Truth be told, I had that. I had a bottle of that. A friend of mine had bought it, and we traded, and I traded for it um, because he didn't He didn't really get into it. And I, I liked it, but I had to learn to like it. It wasn't one that I loved right off, right off the bat. When I started the role, I mean, um, we had, again, ho- I'm going to use the word hodgepodge, but we had a hodgepodge of whiskeys at Ben Rieg, and I think it was almost overwhelming for the – the U.S. side, having acquired these single malts, having kind of been out the single malt game for a little bit of time, to just look at, especially Ben Rieck, like, oh my gosh, there is so many different styles of whiskey coming out. We're just producing so many different peated and unpeated expressions and triple distilled expressions. They were It was hard for them to get their head around it. And I remember Curiositas distinctly trying it. And I, like you, I kind of was like, huh, this isn't peated whiskey like yeah. I know it. And it is quite of a curveball. But I miss that whiskey. So, I love the Smoky 10, but I love it so much. It's got a real special yeah. place in my heart because it has that kind of – oh, it's, you can really taste the barley. And I don't mean the grain. It's not the, the grain spirit, but you can really taste that malted yeah. barley that has been smoked. It's such a distinctive taste, and it is quite yeah. powerful, um, albeit kind of you know a different style of peat that's not medicinal, but it is still powerful. But this – the Smoky 10 – Powerful as it may be, it's not that kind of power that you might get behind some of the yeah. Iowa whiskeys. Um, it's a little bit more mellowed out. And you get this kind of inclusion of, again, that sugar snap sweetness coming from the rum. You also get that kind of maybe a tiny hint of the tropical fruits coming in as well. The banana, the pineapple coming from the rum casks. The virgin oak lifting up the vanilla note there. And then the bourbon cask giving you that lovely honey crisp. You got a little, well. little mint but, on the finish um, too, which was kind of nice. Just a freshen- freshness yeah, to it. it freshness a freshness yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely rum casks i'm always a little bit of a skeptical yeah. i think skeptical with rum casks when they're using single malt or anywhere really because rum casks can get just used and mm. abused in uh wherever they are because there's no law they just keep <laughs> reusing those casks until they are falling yeah. apart so to get a rum cask that actually has these kind of tropical notes this coconut note almost like toasted coconut you get with the the smoky 10 there um pineapple that really is a testament to the quality of the rum casks because they must have gotten them um when they've not been just exhausted they've obviously gotten them when they've still got some life in them to give back because i've had some whiskeys where you really don't taste much yeah. at all of the rum coming through and that's probably because they're just overused dead. yeah they're just dead casks overused so yeah. um as we move to the Smoky, smoky 12, the um, the question I have is, if you were a malting facility for so long, what happened to the malting floors? So we did close them down, um, but we actually have now them back up and running. So we do, can, we are one of the very few distilleries and one of two distilleries in Speyside that still has their malting floors Balvinie in operation. being the other. Yeah. Balvinie, absolutely, yeah. yes. So we do... We don't run it all yeah. the time, and we do not have it going into all of our whiskies, obviously. This is more of a seasonal thing. We do try and coincide it with the Speyside Whiskey Festival that takes place in the spring, so April, May. Um, we do try and have our malting floor up and running for that, so people can come visit mm-hmm. and see it and see a very traditional style of malting that plays into Ben Reeks history, but into the industry as a whole, um, historically speaking. And, yeah, we still have that in operation. Like I said, I was there three weeks, and it is just... Uh, very classic looking malting floor very well done we've got a great big kiln and we'll obviously be shoveling in um peat as well as other smokeless fuels in there if we're doing some unpeated um stocks of malted barley and we'll do all of our malting on site we'll then take that and then run it through the production and actually very interestingly although i know you don't have it to taste (laughs) but worth noting 
um very recently in the last number of i'd say four months three months ago we actually did release our malting season at bin Reek. so this is actually whiskey that we've now started producing on a yearly kind of annual basis we'll release this malting season and this is exclusively whiskey that has been made with barley malted on site and it is absolutely mm. gorgeous it's a non-age statement whiskey um but you know we're looking at maybe kind of hitting the around that 10 year mark or so and it's aged in bourbon and virgin casks and it is fantastic it's got a real kind of old school cereal note that you just don't find in modern mm. day whiskies that's not to bash on the monsters yeah. at all but it's just different it's yeah. quite unique to ben Riek. yeah very nice smoky yes. 12 though you've yep. got this in your hand fantastic so this whiskey is when i think when all the the new portfolio was released i was most excited about the smoky mm. 12 because there's one cask in there that kind of is is flashing red to be <laughs> noticed um yeah um so this is bourbon sherry and marsala okay. wine casks and this is unusual so the marsala wine comes from sicily it comes uh it's a, a kind of sweet dessert wine that we find it's not that popular um but it's certainly a lovely drink that you can you can find um, maybe online and try i definitely recommend people trying uh marsala and it really does add a kind of syrupy mm. nature to the whiskey um when talking to dr rachel barry she was looking at vatting this whiskey and she was trying stocks of the uh, marsala wine cask samples and she was saying that it is quite aggressive mm. it really is quite a lot to be putting so there's not much in here but there certainly is enough that you're getting the mouth feel and the flavor coming through and it really is so different this is such night and day from anything in the portfolio a night and day contrast from the smoky 10 to this smoky 12 it has the smoke is still going to be rich in this the smoke level is rich just like the smoky 10 still coming in at 46 percent just like the smoky 10 but the smoke is so much more mellow here it's so much more gentle um one of the ways i like to think about peat smoke when it comes to our whiskies is if you have a mm -hmm. barbecue whether it's in your garden your next door neighbor's garden or a block down the road it's kind of that way i think i, f I feel like the smoky 12 is more of like a couple of neighbors down the road it's not intense it's so gentle and it really doesn't even emerge until kind of mid to back palate into yeah. the finish it's not the first thing you taste which i love because people when they think of smoky whiskeys um i think almost like ipas nowadays it's like they want to be hit right full face hops in the face in the palate boof it's explosion of peat if it's whiskey um but this is not that it's so gentle it's layers of flavor and smoke just happens to be one of those flavors not the dominant it's very easy surprisingly it's kind of like i get uh i get the vanilla i get the uh as well and then the, like the the strawberry thing kind of came back to me again and then as you get towards the the finish you, the grain starts to come out but it's so nicely married with the smoke Neither mm -hmm. one is taking charge of the show. They're both kind of balancing and 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 coming at you, um, saying hello, we're here, but not you know being overly mm -hmm. aggressive. Yeah, it's a it's it's a kind of symphony, and you don't you can dive into the different parts of the the orchestra if you'd like, but you can just kind of sit back and enjoy yeah. them all at once as they're coming Very towards pleasant. you. Um, yeah, really pleasant. This one did exceptionally well. I think um, again, they all have their own merits, but. This was picked up by Whiskey Magazine. They got their top 20. This got number three, so it made it to their front cover. Um, so they did very well um, with the press on this. So I think a lot of people, it quickly sold out, to this... say the least. So it came in to market, and we didn't have a lot of it to start with, and it was quickly back out. But it should be quite readily available now. So it's definitely worth trying. If you're into smoky whiskeys, peated scotch, definitely worth trying but if you're new to single malt scotch whiskey and you want to try something smoky i'd say this is the one to really yeah. try because it is just so mm -hmm. different yeah fantastic so this is what i love about scotch whiskey it's just amazing how you can take one grain and you can get so many different things out of it and the spectrum seven whiskeys here and all seven of them are different so different and again some of them are roughly the same age. Some of them have similarities in the cast types, but 
how that ex- you know how that expression is uh, put onto the nose and the palate is so yeah. different. And it even in Bin Riek's case, like, there's some subtle differences in the production. So when it comes to our unpeated style of spirit, we'll run that still for probably about an hour and a half to an hour and 45 minutes, yeah. give or take. And that's actually one of the widest cuts in Speyside. So you're looking at some distilleries and they'll talk about a very precise cut. Um, I was at Glen Farkless and obviously McAllen's well known for having a very precise cut. Um, and that's just, it's funny because obviously there's nothing wrong with that at all. That's just <laughs> the style of whiskey and they want to make that style of whiskey and it's good. But it's what, it's funny how you can market that as being a very precise cut because you're getting a very sl- a slither of your heart. But really in Ben Reik, you are taking the fullest extent off the heart as you possibly can. So you're getting everything from grain, cereal notes, going into apples, pears, all the way through to some of the heavier notes yeah. as well. And for our peated style of spirit, we're even running that for, I think, 10 minutes longer. So give or take, it could be an hour and 40 minutes or an hour and 55. And that's where all the heavier phenols come from. And so again, you're inclu- you're not changing your heart, you're just elongating yeah. it um, to inc- Incorporate some of those well, all of those little and which give you congeners in the that that come in in the low end of the hearts towards the um, towards the faints are where a lot of mm-hmm. the personality comes in. It's really interesting that you say this because I'm yeah. my friend and I were in this little argument about Macallan, and I'm like, for me, so many of the Macallan whiskeys are um, that they're it's like they don't express themselves enough for me. There, there needs to be more. There's, it's almost like they're flat to me in a way, but everybody loves them because they have the name on them. And I'm like, but the thing is, mm-hmm. is that there's something about them. And I don't know if it's the casks they're using or if it's the, um, uh, if, if, as you say, now we're talking about where they're making very narrow cuts, then they, they are, maybe I'm a fan of those congeners that are missing in what's being produced. That's it. Yeah, I think totally. I mean, there's a, a style of whiskey out there for everyone. And, you know, Macallan is a great example of a whiskey. They've obviously, they've hit yeah. gold on that style of whiskey for, I think, capturing a large part of the market. And I think the branding, the luxury, that all really helps as well towards brand recognition and, you know, perceived prestige and things like that. But I think for malt drinkers, serious malt drinkers, people that are looking for other flavors i think once you get out the realm of macallan what they do they do very well but it is a narrow Mm -hmm. slither um and they do make a lot of different expressions but again it's all kind of very constrained to this style and there's nothing wrong with that but if you do want to try like a distillery i would say bin reek um you know brucladi uh springbank these are all distilleries that do different styles of whiskey and that is what whiskey is all about. It's all about flavor. It's all about pushing the boundaries. It's all about experimenting. And Ben Reek and a handful of these other distilleries across Scotland continue to do that. And that's why I, I'm i fascinated with it. I mean, we've just had our core mm-hmm. range there. And already we've tried a huge spectrum of flavor. We've covered different cask types, um, the inclusion of unpeated and peated spirits together in different variations and ratios, um, different proof levels, different ages, even be it you know 10 yeah. to 12 so massive of a difference and um yeah when it comes to um other things that we have in our portfolio we have a 21 a 25 a 30 all including some peated stocks as well as unpeated so we have old stocks of um peated whiskey and that stuff as it matures just gets so elegant and complex it really does change and the single casks i mean anyone that loves bin reek you, I, I remember I, there was one point I was in my storage and I had to take a picture of this because I had so many bin reeks that I had kind of collected from expressions that were either historic from the archives or things that we had and just kind of ran out of stock on. So they were now obsolete in the market in terms of just tasting with friends and with uh, connoisseurs and things like that. And I had to take a picture. We had about 30 different expressions of, of bin reek there and it was just mad. And they have really done a bit of yeah. everything. It's incredible. To Fantastic. Celebrate. Well, thank you for walking us through and uh, for, for the previous episode, getting people into uh, Glendronic and now jumping into two more whiskeys that I think it's great that it will help people recognize what's on the shelf and maybe know a little bit uh, more about what they're picking out when they're going for, for Scotch whiskeys. But love the history as well and uh, appreciate you for okay. sharing all of that with us. Thank you so much. No, and uh, definitely, I mean, Ben Reek has changed. So definitely, if you haven't cha- tried the new changes, try it. Glenglassa, worth trying, absolutely. It is a phenomenally 
um, just big, rich, and robust distillery, but one to watch for because there will be some changes potentially coming down the way for that distillery, and I am so excited, so can't wait to see what happens. Slange. Slange, va. Cheers. <laughs>